good day. This is a uh, podcast on some of the advanced mathematics of computational chemistry with a focus on molecular orbital theory. If you recall, we start from the Schrodinger equation, which is the Hamiltonian times the wave function equals energy times the wave function. And it turns out mathematically that we cannot really solve the Schrodinger equation and what we need to do is we need to multiply both sides times psi and so what this ends up giving us is psi times the Hamiltonian times psi equals E psi squared and from that point on what we are then able to do is we're able to do what's known as an integration of both sides. That's a calculus function. And it turns out that when you take the integral of something that's a constant, in this case E is a constant, that gives us psi h psi is equal to E, the integral of psi squared on the other side and all of that is integrated over this thing called d tau. Let me stick one in here as well. And that d tau, basically, this thing there says over all space, meaning over three-dimensional space of the molecule. So pretty complicated so far. And what that gives us mathematically is E is equal to the integral of psi h psi over all space all divided by the integral of psi squared over all space and that is reduces down our mathematics to something that's a little bit solvable. The bottom line is what you want to be able to do out of this is calculate the energy E and now we have a form in which we need to do this. Okay, still pretty complicated thing to solve so let's take a look at a system Let's suppose I have a molecule that just has two atoms in it, and I can call this um, I can call this carbon one, and I can call this carbon two. It turns out that what I now can do is I can come up with psi one and psi two, and because those are the wave functions on a single atom, we call this an atomic orbital. Okay, so that would be an atomic orbital 1 and atomic orbital 2. And it turns out that the whole function psi, which is what goes in place up here, okay, is going to be equal to these little baby psi's. Okay, so these atomic orbitals. And both of these are going to be multiplied by some coefficient. I'm going to call them C1 and C2. So that's a very simple little system. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take this mathematics. So this is really the wave function for the whole molecule. And these are the wave functions for, I probably should put little C1 and little C2 here. Don't get confused with these other Cs. So I'm going to take all of this stuff up here and substitute it back into everywhere there where I have a psi wave function. And what that looks like if I show you that uh, expanded out is that shows, if I expand that out and I plug all that stuff in there, I get a very complicated looking mess. And what we're trying to do is to be able to simplify that a little bit. Okay. And again, if I continue to expand on out, I get this thing all simplified down. And there we, those are these little things here, these little C1s and C2s here are called atomic coefficients. And you should recognize the H's there as being the, being the Hamiltonian. Okay. It turns out now that I can do another substitution. So I have the Hamiltonian, that's the H thing there. And you've run across that a few times. Okay, there's the Hamiltonian. But the other thing I can do to solve some of this mathematics is I can replace some of this mathematics with the letter S. And that's known as the Slater, named after J.C. Slater, overlap integral or equation. 
And what that is, that's a measure of how much an atomic orbital and another atomic orbital, and if you can imagine, here's the wave function and here's the wave function there on those atomic orbitals, that's a measure of how much these two wave functions might overlap. So what I'm trying to show you here is in that little space right there, I'm trying to show you that these two atomic orbitals will overlap. And that number s is a measure of how much those things overlap. Okay, The Hamiltonian here is a measure of, if you remember, kinetic energy, nuclear electron repulsion, or attraction, excuse me, okay, electron, electron repulsion, and all of those things. Okay. It turns out, again, if I, if I keep working on through the mathematics, um, it, it does not get any easier, okay? It gets significantly harder. But what happens is if I work on through the mathematics, and there actually is a copy of that document uh, available to you. If you're really interested in the mathematics, you are welcome to take a look at it. Um, but it turns out here for a molecule and I'm going to only focus on carbons. I'm going to ignore all the hydrogens, okay? So I'm going to call this, this is atom 1 and this is atom 2. It turns out that what I get is what's known as a matrix. And that matrix, it, matrix is equal to 0. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put 1 and 2 on this side and 1 and 2 up here. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a basically a, what's called a, what I call a connection matrix. Okay, and so here's what that looks like. Okay, so we're going to look at the intersection of one and one. Okay, one is connected to one and one are the same thing, so I'm going to put an X there. That means they're the same thing. Two and two are the same thing. So I'm going to put an X there, okay? At this point, 1 is connected to 2, so I'm going to put a 1 there, okay? 2 is connected to 1, and I'm going to put a 1 there, okay? So I'm going to call, and this matrix, by the way, is called a secular determinant, and we'll come back to that momentarily, okay? Uh, what about if I have a 3 atom. Okay, I'm just going to draw this one. Okay, one, two, and three. One, two, and three. And so one is one is itself, two is itself, three is itself. Okay, and this is one, two, and three. Okay, one is connected to two, so I'm going to put a one there. One is not connected to three, so I'm going to put a zero there. Okay, 2 is connected to 1, I'm going to put a 1 there. 2 is connected to 3, I'm going to put a 1 there. Okay, 3 is not connected to 1, I'm going to put a, uh, a 0 there. And 3 is connected to 2, so I'm going to put a 1 there. And I'm going to set that matrix equal to 0. And it turns out for these secular determinants, okay, if, if, I, if I can solve these, Okay. What I find is I will now find the energy of the molecule. Okay. And again, I'm using very simple examples here. And just for grins, let's do one more. Let's do a uh, molecule that has four. Okay, so one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. And you might want to try to be doing this with me. And so there's an X. Notice that the X's are all on the diagonals. Okay. One is connected to two. That's a one. One is not connected to three. That's a zero. One is not connected to four. That's a zero. Two is connected to one. That's a one. Two is connected to three. That's a one. Two is not connected to four. That's a zero. Three is not connected to one. Three is connected to two. Three is connected to four. 4 is not connected to 1, 4 is not connected to 2, 4 is connected to 3, and all of that is equal to 0. And that is, yet again, another secular determinant. And if I can solve that, if 
for these really small systems, okay, what can I can what can I do? I can find the energy of this particular molecule. Okay. Alright, so what we're trying to do here is to be able to find these um, find solve these determinants, solve these matrices. This is called, by the way, this is you are learning a little bit of what's called linear algebra and otherwise known as matrix mathematics. Okay, you may or may not have encountered that yet in school, but that's what we're doing here. Okay, so what does that do for us? It does a couple things. As I've mentioned here a minute ago, okay, I'm going to put the I'm going to put this one back up. Okay, I'm going to put the two system one up here, one, two, one, and two, x and x, one and one. Okay, uh, there's a number of things that we can use this for. Okay, as I mentioned a minute ago, we can find the energy of the molecule by using this matrix. If I can solve this thing um, when it's set to zero, I can find the energy. The other thing I can do is I can find these atomic coefficients. And if you recall, if I redraw this, this one, what I need to know is the wave function for the whole molecule, okay, and that's equal to this atomic coefficient times the first wave function plus the atomic coefficient times the second wave function. Okay, so I need to be able to find C1 and C2. Well, how can I do that? Okay, I can do, okay, I can find the, what's called the determinant of the matrix. Okay, and so I'm going to do that. I'm going to redraw my matrix so I have a little room to work. There's X and 1, 1 and X. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a sort of a cross weave method. I'm going to put a line down through here and I'm going to multiply the things that are on that line. Okay, so that's x times x, that's equal to x squared, and I'm going to put that over here. Uh, now I'm going to draw a line the other way and I'm going to subtract whatever I have there, so that's 1 times 1, that's equal to 1. So the whole the whole equation here is x squared minus 1 and all of that is equal to 0. And what you want to do at this point is you want to be able to solve for x and you should be able to see that x is either plus 1 or x is minus 1 and we would write that plus or minus 1. Okay, So that's the roots of that equation. If you remember the Newton's Law thing that you did uh, right at the beginning of the uh, semester, you could have used the Newton's uh, Law spreadsheet to, uh, or Newton's Method spreadsheet to be able to find the roots of this particular integral, and it would, this one's pretty easy to do by inspection. Okay, all right. Um, let's do one that's a little bit harder. Okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do my, my, I've got three atoms. Okay, 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, and 3, x, x, and x, 1 is connected to 2, not connected to 3, 2 is connected to 1, 2 is connected to 3, not there and not there, okay, so I now have that matrix, okay, and now I have what's called, by the way, this is called a 3 by 3 matrix, okay, this is called a 3 by 3 matrix, and what I'm going to do is, again, that it's a little bit more complicated this time. I'm going to draw my line uh, diagonal top left to bottom right. So what I have there is x cubed. I hope you can see that. Okay. What I'm going to do at this point is do a cross weave. And what that means is I'm going to go the same direction. But notice how I've gone through two numbers here. I've got to backtrack here and go through a single number. So what you should see here is I've got 1 times 1 times 0. Okay. And then I'm going to do one more weave from that direction. I go through a single number here and now I've got a cross weave on up and go through these two numbers. So I've got 0 times 1 
times 1. I'm sorry, I got in the way of my weave. So for my last part, I'm doing that number, that number, and that number. And if I do all that, I have x cubed plus 0 plus 0. So for the forward weave, I ended up at the very end with simply having x cubed. Okay, so that's the first part. Now what do I have to do? I need to change pieces of paper. So what do I have? x1 and 0, x and x. Here's my matrix. I've got 1 and 1. I've got 0 and 1. Okay, I hope that matrix is right. So I've gotten from doing the forward weave, I've got an x cube. Now I need to, to do, and that was a the weave coming from that direction. Now I need to do a weave in that direction. And so I'm going to do that weave. So I'm going to do this one first. Okay. And that's 0 times x times 0. That's going to be pretty easy. Plus what I'm going to do now is a weave this way, come back and catch that top value there. So that's going to be 1 times 1 times x. And then I'm going to do the third weave up there and down through here. And that's going to be x times 1 plus 1. Okay. So if I multiply all that out, that gives me x plus x. And all of that is 2x. And keep in mind when you do, this is the forward weave. Okay. And this is the reverse weave. Okay. And when what you do with your reverse weave is you take the negative of it. So my solution for this one, for the 3 by 3, is x cubed minus 2x. Okay. And if you were to want to find the determinant, the, excuse me, the first derivative of that, that would be 3x squared minus 2. If you want to remember for Newton's method, you need f of x and you need f prime of x. Okay. And if you wanted to try to go put that in your um, Newton's method solver and see what roots you get. Okay, it is the case okay, that you should find three roots okay, because you have a three by three matrix. Okay, so you should have three roots there, and I will uh, encourage you to go try to find those three roots and see if you can find them. I can do that again on my uh, Newton spreadsheet but you should go try to see if you can find the three roots for that. So that's a beginning. I'm going to stop this podcast at this point so it's not too big of a file. So this is part A of some of the underlying mathematics that we're going to be needing to learn for molecular orbital theory, and we'll continue this in part B. So stay tuned and hope to see you on the next part.